Uh, we're kind of in between series right now. Next week, Pastor Adam is going to be kicking off uh, an incredible series on the book of Nehemiah. And we're going to be talking about, uh, really, the title is, is Supernatural Building and, and looking at how uh, to build the kingdom of God and just tools and principles we can see through the book of Nehemiah that we can apply to our lives and how we walk. So it's going to be an incredible series. But this weekend, uh, I kind of have just a, a, a one-off, a standalone message that I want to bring to you guys today that I felt the Lord just put on my heart uh, and wanted to share with you guys. And so... Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn it to uh, Revelations 2. Uh, while you're getting there, I'm going to go ahead and pray and open us up. Father, we thank you for who you are, God, in our lives. We thank you for the opportunity we have to serve your kingdom. God, we just turn our hearts to receive your word today, Father God, to, to hear a message, to, to take down any of our, our, our callousness, our, our, our walls that we have may put up, Father God, and to receive and hear from you today, Father God. Lord, I pray that it be your word spoken and not my own, Father God that it would fall on just ears and hearts ready to receive. So we love you and we thank you in your name. Everybody said, amen. amen. So Revelations, I know you guys get excited. The church world gets excited when we go into the book of Revelation. And they're like, oh, man, we're going to talk about the end times. This is going to be good. We're not talking about the end times, so I apologize. I know a great group of people that can help you with that around group season, though. But uh, today, we're gonna, the Revelation is actually more about just the, the end times. It's surprise, surprise. Uh, but we're going to talk about that a little bit um, in, in what Revelation has to say for us. So um, the topic I want to talk about today correlates with something that I feel like we all deal with in some way. It's something that uh, a lot of people have gone through, maybe be in, or may even go through in the future. And it's something that a lot of people don't really necessarily talk about or share with one another. Um, but it's these times where we kind of find ourselves getting stuck in a rut, where we find ourselves in seasons of where well, we're not really sure where to go next. We're not really sure how we got here. And we find ourselves in this lull and this, this even sometimes a depression or even a, a, a season of like, I don't know how to go from here. And you feel stuck, you feel worn out, and, and you're not really sure how to take the next steps. And uh, we're going to be talking about that today a little bit, but I want to look at Revelations 2, uh, because chapters 2 and 3, there's, there's the seven letters there written to the, the current churches of the time, uh, and, and it's, it's the record of these letters. The first one I want to look at, well, the only one I want to look at really, um, was in Revelations 2, 1, and it's written to uh, the church of Ephesus, the Ephesians, and it says this. It says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, and just so you're not confused, uh, angel, uh, the, the context of this would be more so the messenger, uh, often the, the, the pastor, the person leading the, and giving the message to the congregation. Uh, so he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, uh, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. They're referring to Jesus. He says, he says this, he says, I know your works your toil and your patient endurance. And I know how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. And I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. And that's, that's a great report. That's, that's the exciting part of that report. But there's sometimes in life, there's always that but or that yet, and uh, that's where he's about to get to. He says, but I have this against you. He said that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And when I read these letters that, that are in Revelation, often the churches, I, I kind of have this idea and thought of them so much as like a, like a report card. How many of you guys remember report cards? Schools are starting back up. How many of you are the type of people that were anxious and excited to get your report cards back in the day when they like they used to mail them to their parents and uh, you got excited? Anybody that anybody in here get excited for report card season? Like that? Was, go ahead. You can raise your hand. Raise them. You can be proud. You got good grades. It, it's okay. The rest of us are just looking around, just thinking we didn't like you too much. You you were. <laughs> You were the one that was like, hey, uh, teacher, you know, we had homework and we're not reviewing it. Is it okay if we review the homework? And everyone's like, what are you doing? Don't bring that up. So it's kind of like a report card in a sense. And, 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 and Ephesians is getting this report card and it's not a great report. They're getting a report card that, hey, I see you doing a lot of good things, but you're struggling really spiritually uh, you, you're being good at, at doing the kind of the do's and the don'ts, and, and, and it's really, it's almost like saying you're, you're good at being religious, but you've abandoned the love that you had. You let go of the passion and the why behind it. You're, you're hardworking, I see that, but you no longer have that same passion that you once did when you first believed. Your work is no longer motivated by love. 
And they have done a lot of good uh, spiritually. And, and, and it's kind of like you can take that and say, oh, you know, it's kind of their participation trophy. Like, I, I'm excited. I'm getting a pat on the back for some of these things. But it's kind of though that they're missing the mark still. They haven't quite understood the why behind what they're actually doing. They're not really excelling at what the spirit of it that they should be doing. And if we're being honest, this wouldn't be a way that many of us would want our lives defined. If you were to have someone write about your life, I would hope they wouldn't write about how you had lost your love and your passion for the Lord. Maybe you're doing things right and, and, and it looks religious and you have the great to-do list and you have the, the right attitude to, uh, to check people and, and judge people but you have lost the heart and the love behind it. And it would be a poor report to find. But if you're like me, we'd probably want our spiritual lives to be more defined as how David writes about it in, in Psalm 69.9. For the zeal of your house has consumed me. One, brash, one version says that you know, the passion for your house consumes me. He writes in Psalm 63.1, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in dry and weary land, there is no water. We would want our, our spiritual lives to look a lot more like those verses than we would the report that the Ephesians got right there. But the reality is often in our life, we find that every day isn't this mountaintop experience, that it's not this, this, this go jolly moment. And the truth is that there is times and moments and seasons that we find ourselves struggling, that we find ourselves in a lull, and we find ourselves in, a, in, 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 in our relationship with God can somehow be difficult or, or hard to, to comprehend. It feels a little disconnected. I would say even in full-time ministry, I feel this. And you would think, hey, you know, pastors, they got it made. They can just go sit in their office, read the word, and they just are constantly connected to the Lord. Let me tell you, that is, is difficult for us as well. We, we have these mountaintops and valley seasons the same as you would. And I find today's message just kind of fitting for the season we're in because as we close out the summer, as we move into the fall, uh, oftentimes the summer we, 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 we kind of break our routines, we break our rhythms, and we kind of take our foot off the gas a little bit. We started off the year strong with all these New Year revel uh, revelations, uh, resolutions and, and, and these ideas of how we want to make the, the year look, and then summer rolls around and we kind of all that starts to fall apart a little bit. And we find ourselves in really this, this summer lull where we've kind of taken our foot off the gas and we've broken some of these routines. And, and for some of you, you've kind of gotten to a place where you might even feel stuck, where, you, where you're not sure how to navigate out of this season. And so I want to talk today about that, getting, getting unstuck, getting through this season. Because when you're stuck spiritually, it's, it's a dangerous place to be in. It's a dangerous place to be in because it affects your jobs, it affects your marriage, it affects your parenting. A spiritual rut will affect your attitudes, your confidence, your identity. But the good news is we don't have to stay there. We don't have to be stuck there for long. But it's okay to recognize that you're not weird because you're in the season. It's okay to admit that you're going through a season like this. It's, in fact, it's all throughout scripture where this happens to the, some of the greatest leaders that God calls, some of the, the people most faithful to him. You could look at Moses and the, the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Surely there was a spiritual rut in that experience. Elijah, who did phenomenal miracles on the top of Mount Carmel, but shortly after that, if you read scripture, he enters into a spiritual rut. King David, the man after God's own heart, but if you look at the mistakes he found after he made those mistakes he found himself in these ruts and the list goes on the apostle paul the disciples and so many things and the fact is that we hit these spiritual ruts sometimes in our life whether we're 20 years saved or two months saved and we need to be careful that we don't put expectations on our relationship with god that every day is going to be this mount sinai experience that every day is going to be the shekinah glory of god falling down that that we're going to see the clouds and the fire of the lord that that if we have these false expectations as we, as we, as we encounter the Lord, and I love Journey, we, we encounter the Lord on Sunday mornings, amen? It feels so good in the presence of God and the worship set, and you kind of walk away like just kind of charged up and ready for the week, and Monday and Tuesday rolls around, and you're kind of like caught off guard a little bit, and it feels like, man, I feel like I don't, I don't know how to get back to that. I don't know how to experience the Lord in that way, and, and you kind of discourage yourself thinking maybe I'm not living right because I don't feel this way. But this morning, I want to help walk you through to, 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 to help define if you're in a rut, to help, help walk you through and understand of how you got there, but more importantly, how to get out of that rut. So I want to define it first. What is a rut? Uh, what do you do when you want to define something? Everybody nowadays, go to Google. Google has the best answers. Barbara, you said it before it came out of my mouth. She's on it. She's got my notes. 
So if you Google rut, well, how is it defined? It's defined as a long, deep track made by repeated passage of wheels of vehicles. This important part that I want to go back to in a little bit is that repeated passage. Uh, we're in Florida. Anybody enjoy off-roading in here? You've been off-roading. You're an active off-roader. Uh, I thought there'd be more off-roaders in here. No, we're not quite Middleburg yet. We didn't get all the way down there. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, but the, the idea is this off-roading, and you're probably familiar with it, is there, there's often these heavy tracks that are in the mud, and they go back and forth, and um, I tend to be a little ambitious, and I like to go off-roading a little bit. Uh, my issue, though, is I don't have any vehicles that are capable of off-roading, and so uh, I still try it anyways, and I find myself in sticky situations where I find myself stuck in a rut, right? Um, just most recently, I had this, this happen to me. Um, uh, one of the ways that I enjoy connecting with God, that I connect with God, and, and, and you can learn how you do that best, go through growth tracks, shameless plug for growth tracks, is I connect with God through nature often. And so I enjoy being out in creation. I enjoy kind of just taking in uh, who he is through creation and enjoy, it refills me, it refreshes me. And so I like to get outside and go explore often. And, and one of the ways that I find was kind of helpful for me to do that is me and my daughter uh, over the past winter would often take walks in our neighborhood and bring her out for her bike ride and kind of go in about and, and explore a little bit in the neighborhood and I could kind of get my fix for the creation side. But then summer rolled around and I realized, man, I don't want to encounter the Lord that way anymore because I'm thinking of something beyond the Lord. I'm thinking of how hot it is and the place I don't want to go. Uh, and so I didn't want to go outside as much. And, and so I tried to combat that a little bit. And so one of the things that we did this past summer is we got our, um, a little golf cart that we drive around the community with. And I love doing this with her. We're kind of in a friendly neighborhood for it. And so I take her out on little trips and we go exploring through some woods sometimes and some other areas and uh, and she loves doing it. She's three years old and she loves going up and down the bumpy road and just kind of laughing and uh, yelling at me the whole time. But there was this one time uh, recently where they had recently cleared out, um, the, I'm in a newer neighborhood, newer development, and they've cleared out a mile or two of land recently and they're building more homes back there. Uh, and, and I wasn't trespassing, but I was just driving through to, to check out the, the, uh, to check out the, the new land. And um, they hadn't quite put down a road yet. It had been more just so uh, a truck had kind of dredged the road, I guess you could say. Uh, and it had been raining all this past week. And so we, I took her back there and it goes back like a mile or two. And so we're back there almost all the way in the back. And I noticed like, hey, the dirt's starting to get uh, pretty wet. It's starting to get pretty slimy back here. Um, the golf cart we have has decent tires on it. It's lifted up a little bit. Um, but I realized I probably shouldn't be back here this far with this, uh, with this vehicle. And so uh, right as I, that came to my mind, I was like, okay, let's stop and turn around. And so I decided to do that. Um, and the, the road that I was on, the, the path, I don't, it wasn't really a road. Uh, I couldn't turn around. Uh, one of the rules in like off-roading is you're, if you don't have the appropriate vehicle is don't stop. Uh, so I was like, as long as I keep going, I'm good. But I had to stop in order to turn around. And so I put it in reverse to kind of back out and to do like a little three-point turn. And as I backed up, I quickly felt the tires start to spin. And I said, oh my gosh, I am stuck. Uh, I knew exactly where I was. I, I knew what had happened. I was stuck. Uh, but I said, you know what, it would be fine. Um, this three-year-old can definitely help me push out of here and we're going to be good to go. Uh, and she, she's going to be the best helper. And so I get out to go check on it and to see how bad we were stuck. And as I get out, it was, it was kind of fine. But as I stepped towards the back of the golf carts, I sank almost all the way down to my knees in mud. I, I just, it was like quicksand. And I said, oh, man, I recognized I had just fallen into a rut in the dirt. They have these big bulldozers that go through, and it created these deep ruts that went through the dirt. And because it had just rained, it all filled in with mud. And so the whole back end of the golf cart was sunk all the way into the mud. And I said, you know what? I'm a guy. I can pull this out. Uh, and so I'm going to lift, and then I'm going to teach my three-year-old how to drive this golf cart. Uh, <laughs> And she did great. She, I said, just on the count of three, hit the button. One, hits the button. I just start spraying me. Uh, and so I'm covered with mud. Uh, uh, needless to say, we did not get out of that rut. And so I had to walk back about a mile or so uh, with her as she, uh, she was a good trooper about it. She just thought we were on a journey still. Hey, good parenting tip that I learned, just, just remain calm the whole time. They have no idea what's going on. Uh, and so we walked about a mile. I'm literally head to toe covered in mud. Debbie picks us up at the end of the street and she's like, what in the world did you do? Uh, and she's like, I'm going to take her home and you go figure out how to do that. And so I went and found a shovel and it took about two hours to dig myself out of that hole uh, and get it out. But what I realized in that moment is that the, 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 this is something that we can apply spiritually. 
that these ruts that we find ourselves in can be very similar to this circumstance to where we can be going along and find ourselves suddenly in, in a rut, find ourselves suddenly stuck and not really sure how we got there, what we've done to allow ourselves to get in this position, but we find ourselves stuck and we're not sure how to get out of it. And the second definition of a rut really goes in, in, in hand in hand with that. It's, it's a habit or pattern or behavior that has become dull and unproductive, but it's hard to change. Has your spiritual life ever felt like that? Dull and unproductive and hard to change at times. The reality is you're still going to heaven. You, the, the Lord, you still love the Lord. He's in your hearts, but your life has become dull and unproductive. And it just seems very hard to get out of the season that you're in. Because the truth is, it takes no effort to get into a spiritual rut. It, it can happen quick. It can happen without you paying attention. And it just, you fall into these moments, but it takes a whole lot of effort and intentionality to get yourself out. It takes, it, it, it is un, dull and unproductive and, and it's hard to change. So it takes a lot of intentionality to pull yourself out. So I want to just go over real quick two truths about these spiritual ruts. First, that ruts are common, right? We, we, we determined that. We've talked about that. You're not weird that you get into these seasons. They're common. But two, ruts are normal to be in, but never okay to stay in, right? You can get into a rut and you can acknowledge you're in a rut, but you need to catch the fact that it's not okay to, to stay in that spot. We can acknowledge it, but we're not going to approve of it, that it's, this is where we are, but we need to move out of it. And I hope that helps some of you today to acknowledge that it's okay to recognize the season you're in. You can talk to other people and let them know, but just don't stay in this season because we can't allow commonality to become a regularity in our life. It can't, just because it's common for one, it shouldn't be something that we are okay with continuing to go back to and continue to stay into. And so I'm speaking for myself here as well because the enemy wants to keep us in this rut. Because when we are in these spiritual ruts, ultimately we are ineffective for the kingdom of God. Right? When we're in these ruts, it becomes very me-focused, it becomes very me-centered, and, and I can't really focus on what everyone else is doing or how to help someone else because I'm stuck in this position. I'm, un, I'm, I'm unmotivated, I'm dull, I'm not ready to help others in this moment because I'm stuck in my, own, in my own spot, and we become ineffective for the kingdom of God. Our salvation is secured, but our effectiveness on earth becomes strongly affected, and the enemy thrives on these spiritual ruts. And it's part of, what, you know, Peter says in, in 1 Peter 5.8, he says to be alert, be on watch because your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I truly believe it's in these extended seasons of spiritual ruts that the devouring happens, that we find ourselves unprotected, unalert, and unaware of, of how the enemy is affecting our lives. So now that we know what a rut is, let's talk about how do we get there in the first place. What do we do to allow ourselves or how could we better judge uh, of where we are in this season? And I just want to go through three questions that you could be constantly and consistently asking yourself. The question one I would say is how am I spending my time? How am I spending my time? If you want to identify spiritual ruts, ask yourself this question and, and, and even say it this way, is God still a priority in my life? Is he the first of my day? Is he the first in my family? Is God still first in my business? Is he first in my finances? Is he first in my thoughts? Because when he's not first, what we recognize is we've replaced him with something else. And, we have, and we're in terms of, of, of our time, we have neglected our relationship with him. We have neglected leading and walking in this. And it sounds so simple and it could be such a, a practical question, an easy question, I guess, sure, I get it. But the more and more you have conversations with people, especially uh, in, in a ministerial leadership role, like the questions I have with you, is you find that people, the first things that they're doing in, in these areas of struggles, if they've kind of, they've found themselves in a rut because they've neglected these foundational disciplines. They, they, they are not prioritizing their time. They're not reading their Bible anymore every day anymore. They're not spending time in prayer every day. They're not listening to worship music and engaging in worship like they used to. They haven't served or been a part of community in over a year. They're no longer in, connected to their small groups. And they lead to this continued place uh, of neglect, which leads to a continued misinterpretation and misguidings of priority. And so one day we neglect God, two days we neglect God, three days, four days, five days, it continues to build and build. Some of you may open up your Bible app and, and you know, we started a reading plans and all those things, or maybe this is the normal way you read you through the app, the thing, and some of you have opened your app before and, sent, and saw like 45 days since last read, and you're like, oh my goodness, how did I let 45 days go? 
How did I let 100 days go? How did I let 10 days go? And you recognize, and it's an easy way to recognize that you've allowed neglect to take place. And you wonder why we're in the ruts that we're in. And before we know it, we have distanced ourselves from God. And what happens in this neglect is we muddy our connection with him. When you've got Jesus in your heart, nobody's going to take it away. But what happens in this neglect is we don't lose our salvation, but really I would argue that we lose our intimacy with him, that we lose connection with him, that we lose our ability to hear him as clearly as we did at one point. Because we're so focused on other things, we're so focused in prioritizing things above him that we no longer are willing to listen for the voice of the Father. We're no longer listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit and we're affecting our intimacy with him. And as time passes, we dig ourselves deeper and deeper into this rut. It feels as though we stepped a thousand ways from God. But I love it, the fact that he's always just one step back. And the Bible gives us just a quick reminder in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom. It doesn't say make sure he's on the list, but make sure that he's first on the list and his righteousness and then everything else we need will be added. So are we neglecting time with him? That's the first question. How am I spending my time? The second one I say is, are you staying close to Jesus? They kind of play hand in hand, but some of you could really intentionally read, but still have something that interferes your relationship with the Lord, that gets in the way, that allows you to stay in a rut. And that's all the word that's called sin. Sin gets in the way and it creates a barrier, it creates a hindrance between you and the Lord because you're acknowledging him, but you're choosing to live a lifestyle that is against his word. It affects your closeness to him. It could be the sin of omission. It's, it's, it's things that we should do but that we're not doing. It could be the sin of commission. It's the things that we shouldn't do in the first place. And all of these things disrupt our relationship with the Lord because we're allowing it to take priority. That's why Paul, as he's writing in Ephesians, he's, he's really talking about uh, guarding unity, but he gives us just a little uh, reminder of how we are to protect ourselves, how we're to guard our hearts. And, and he mentions, you know, don't even go to sleep angry, don't even go to sleep in sin. And he kind of tags it with this, and he says in Ephesians 4, 27, he says, and don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a foot in the door. Sometimes we allow these little sins in our life, these little habits, these little rituals, these, 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 these little things that, we, hey, it maybe affects them, but it doesn't affect me as much. It's not affecting my walk with the Lord. And it's these small things that we give a foothold to the devil into our lives, and we wonder three months, six months, seven months down the road why we find ourselves in these ruts. Solomon, the wisest man ever, I love how he says it. He says it's the small foxes that spoil the vine. It's, it's the recognition that it, everyone's aware of the big things. Everyone keeps their guard up for the big things, but it's the small, unnoticeable things that often that you have allowed into your life that spoil the harvest. So why even leave the door cracked open a little bit to the sin and those things in our lives? It keeps us in the ruts. The third question, am I growing? Am I growing spiritually? Am, am I moving? Am I taking steps forward to grow in my faith, to grow in relationship with him? Am I making progress? Am I stewarding that influence that God has given me? Because God desires a relationship with him that is thriving, that is continuing to move forward, that we're growing closer and learning and growing deeper with him. And if we get stuck in a rut so that, that we're not growing or not moving forward, we find ourselves really in a place of stagnation. And we find ourselves stagnant and it feels like, it feels weird because we're, we're reading the Bible, we're, 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 we're coming to church, we're listening to worship, we're engaging in worship and you do all these things and, and nothing has changed and you just feel stagnant. And it feels like I'm going through the motion but I don't sense anything, I don't feel the change, I don't feel the closeness to the Lord that I should have. I still feel stuck in this season. And sometimes when you're stagnant the problem is just simply that something has to change, that you should change your rhythm and somehow... You've allowed your routine to become mundane, mundane and, and boring and rigid. And your spiritual walk has literally become like a Christian to-do list. And you kind of walk through this idea of just uh, of religion. And, and you lose your excitement and joy and passion for the Lord. And you lose the idea of relationship with him. And Jesus gives us insight on this in Matthew 15, 8. As he's kind of talking about what a stagnant life looks like. And he's really speaking to the Pharisees and, and calling them out for getting caught up in this routine and religion. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And you get an insight with that scripture of just, of the Lord searches the heart. He's looking for the heart. You can have all the to-do lists. You can have all the routines. You can do all the correct do's and don'ts. But if your heart is far from him, then you're missing the points. 
much like the Ephesians, we're still getting caught up in, in the, the to-do list, but our hearts, their hearts and their connection, their closeness was not there. They had lost the passion for it. And so we talked about what gets us there. We talked about the neglect, the sin, the stagnation, but how do we get out of it? How do, I want to give some encouraging ways to talk about getting, to getting out of this season. Because you're not stuck there. There is a way to get out, and we're going to get out. Simply look back at the verse we started with in Revelation 2.5. If you read the, the first four verses, he kind of ends on the fifth with this, this kind of recipe for getting out of it. It's, it's remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Remember where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. If you have been in a rut for a while, if you find yourself in a rut right now, if you've been through one before or, or you're just taking notes to avoid one in the future, to get out of this situation, you need to be aware of where you are. This translation here to, to, to uh, identify where you are, to, to, to recognize where you have fallen, literally translates to, to remember or to be mindful or to apply your mind to understanding. So you've got to identify where you are. That first definition of the, the word rut, it says because of the, the repeated passage of vehicles. And so as you apply your mind to understanding, it's recognizing these ruts that you've even created in your life of these repeated paths you continue to take of, man, I keep making this decision. I keep going down this road. I keep hanging out with this individual. I keep choosing this option over that option. And you recognize that each time you do that, you're continuing to ingrain into that rut and to dig yourself down deeper and deeper. But as you grow and as you walk your way out of this, as you intentionally try to navigate out of this rut, you'll recognize what had caused you into it in the first place and be able to choose your way out of it and be able to choose I'm not going to go down that path anymore it says repent and do the things they did at first so the second step I would say is identify where you are and then repent surrender to Jesus there has to be a moment that as we have identified the situation as we identify what has caused us to get here that we choose in that moment to repent and surrender to Jesus and turn away repent literally just means turn away from it to go the opposite direction to move away from the sin and to do something different to repent and move and surrender and give it all to Christ and some of us we just need a good old fashioned repentance in our life at times we need a good old fashioned just surrendering something to Jesus and say Lord I'm going to turn from this I'm not just going to keep praying and ask that you forgive me of it, but I'm literally going to turn away from it and not continue in this pattern or habits. Because in repentance, not only do we find forgiveness, but we find restoration. The third thing Revelation tells us to do in this, this, this scripture is do the, do the things you did at first. It calls us to action. It calls us to, to participate in something, to, to make a decision to move forward. Once we repent, and then it's time for us to take action. It's time for us to move forward. I get it. You know, I'm, I'm the type of person that can sometimes be like, hey, I'll start the gym on Monday, and it just seems like Monday never comes, right? I'll, yeah, no, that's next Monday. No, that's next Monday. Listen, your spiritual life is so much more valuable. Your spiritual life holds so much weight that we can't keep putting off till Monday. We can't keep putting off for the next week or the next sermon. You need to make a decision now and say it's time to take action to get out of this. And we're going to close shortly with, with worship, and the prayer team is going to be here in just a few minutes. And, and before we even get there, I want you to begin to prepare your heart now to receive from the Lord. Because I believe some of you are going to get out of this rut that you have allowed yourself to get into over the summer. And God is going to break some things off your life. And, 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 and it's going to be a special morning because you are going to submit and surrender to Jesus. You're going to identify where you are and surrender to him. And you're going to choose today to take action in it. But before we do that, I want to give you some very practical steps for based off where you may find yourself. Because I don't want to just be very vague about it. But I wanted to help you in this, this, this season that you're in. And so if you find yourself in a rut today because of neglect, I would simply say it's time to prioritize God again. Tomorrow morning, get up and spend time with God first thing. Make an appointment with the Lord. Make time with him each and every day. If you need help with what that time looks like, we've done, uh, we've put together those personal encounter guides and you can see them in the lobby, the next steps. Those are just templates to help you with this, to help you prioritize this time to spend in his, in, in his, in his presence. It's, it's an attitude of saying, you know what, I, I'm going to make an appointment to meet with the Lord today. We don't miss our doctor's appointments. We don't miss our PTO, school, meet, meet, all these appointments that we make. So make an appointment with the Lord each and every day and say, Lord, I am going to spend time with you today. 
make a priority to get into his presence. For some of us, it's simply time to get back to a daily routine, not a religious habit, but an intentionality of, hey, I'm gonna follow this process every day of the week, each and every day, I'm gonna get into his word. I'm, I'm, I, I used to have worship playing on my way to work, I'm gonna go back to that. I used to be in a small group, I'm gonna get back and connected with that. I used to have some things in my life that I've been, but I'm now neglecting, I'm gonna choose to get back into those routines. And today we're gonna make a decision to get back and prioritizing him. For some of you, it's, it's starting to serve again. You've kind of let one Sunday go, two Sundays go, a month go, a year go, and you haven't really been giving yourself to help and lead others. It's been very focused on you. This rut has just made you me-centered and worried about my situation, my circumstances where you haven't been pouring out to other people like you should. Maybe you, maybe you find yourself burnt out. Maybe you, you, you served for so much for a season that you, you weren't good at saying no and you allowed your place to, to get a part where you don't even want to go back to it. Or, or maybe you've been church hurt or leadership hurt and, and you know, but why would I go back to helping in that way when they didn't appreciate me, they didn't help me, that they weren't nice to me. I, I just felt like I was just kind of running in this wheel, this rat race for them. Listen, can I let you know that if you're serving for man, you're always going to leave hurts. You're always gonna be church hurt if your motivation is to please the ministry leader. As a ministry leader myself, it doesn't excuse that we need to do better. It doesn't excuse that, we, you know, there's, there's areas that we need to work on. But if you're constantly finding yourselves frustrated at ministry leaders as you serve, check your heart to say, well, why am I doing this in the first place? Am I doing it to advance your kingdom? If I am, I can let this go because I'm doing this to please you. And I'm doing this to help others walk in a deeper relationship with you. For some of you, it's time to reinstate accountability back into your life. There used to be those people that you could call when you were having struggle points and there was times that you, you were dealing with things spiritually that you could call and pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm going with X, Y, and Z. I, I need your help with this. Or, or they would call you on a weekly basis and you had that accountability, you had that community, you had that small group that was checking in on you, but you begin to neglect that relationship and you've allowed yourself to dig a, in a rut where no one's checking in on you. Listen, community helps you get out of a rut so much easier. Having community, people around you, Pastor Corey was talking about it even during the transition of the, the, the power of the body of believers. Speaking of getting in ruts, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into it, but earlier this summer, I found myself in another rut. I was at a beach and I had a two-wheel drive vehicle. We normally take our all-wheel drive uh, to the beach and we decided for whatever reason to take this one. And of course, I was like, hey, you know what? I got this. I didn't have it. I dug myself in a hole at the beach. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so several people walked by and I was like, hey, can anybody help pull us out? Everybody's like, nah, that's your fault. You're gonna have to call a tow truck, whatever it may be. And I was like, oh, thank you. Uh, and so I was at the point, I was on the phone. Uh, it was like eight o'clock at night. Uh, we had the kids in the back and, and uh, Debbie's like, why do you keep getting us in these situations? And I said, I don't know, I just went off road. Uh, and, and, and so as I'm calling the tow truck, going, man, it's gonna be an expensive charge to get us out of here. It's gonna be late. Um, uh, the beach is all, like pretty much empty at this point. It's getting dark. Uh, Willie and Angelique walk by us and, and Willie's, like, Willie's like, hey man, can I help you get you out? Can I help pull you out? And then I get out of my car. I was like, dude, I'd love that. He's like, oh, Pastor Joey. Like it was just really cool because he's like, he was willing to help me in that moment, not knowing who I was, but the fact that we had a community together, it was just an exciting moment to know like, man, I got community that's here to help pull me out, to help move me out of this season, to help move me out of this situation. I told William that day that he'd be part of a sermon illustration one day. <laughs> Today was the day. For those of us that are in a rut because of sin, it's time to repent. And before we close today, you're gonna have time to do just that. You're gonna have time to turn away from sin and to enter into a relationship with Jesus. And maybe you've never done that before. Pastor Adam, as we close out after our worship set, is gonna give you the opportunity to do that. But for some of you, you just need to repent of some of the sin you've been allowing in your life that you continue to go back to, that you continue to pray for forgiveness for, but you haven't allowed the Lord to restore you. We've often prayed a prayer of salvation. We prayed a prayer of forgiveness and the Lord forgives you, but you haven't allowed your heart to be restored. You haven't positioned yourself to re receive restoration. You fought back on the renewing of your mind and allow yourself to stay in the same rut. You've received forgiveness, but this morning I'm telling you, God wants to restore you as well. 
And the third one, for those that find themselves in a rut because of stagnation, it's time to keep showing up. Listen, consistency is vital. Consistency is key. Continue to get in the word. Continue to keep praying. Continue to worship. Continue to serve. Keep doing the things that you're doing. But maybe it's time to change some things up. Maybe you need to change just, just your scenery. Get, find a different way to connect with God. Go through growth tracks. Learn how you connect with God best and walk in that season knowing like, hey, this is how I best connect with God, so I'm going to do this. It could be as simple as just changing the worship set you've been listening to for the last 10 years. Like, wow, man, they've come out with some really new good songs recently uh, that I can worship to and enter into his presence with. For some of you, it's just changing the time that you get into his word. Maybe it's become so routine and so mundane that you need to do something new to refresh it. Someone gave me a great tip once that maybe it's, it's going out and simply buying a new Bible. We've been holding on to the same Bible for 20 years and, and we've highlighted the promises, we've highlighted the verses and, and it's incredible to go back and reflect, don't get rid of the Bible, but maybe starting with a new Bible, the Lord's gonna speak to you in new ways that he did from, he, he did something great for you back then, but maybe he wants to do something new for you today. And maybe just highlighting that new verse, highlighting those new verse will remember and bring to thought of who he is, the character and do something new in your life. But you've got to change something. I want to share this verse, and we're going to go into a song of worship, and the ministry teams are going to come into place, and we're going to open up these altars. And I want you to respond based off where you are at in this season, whether it be a rut or, or dealing or coming out of a rut. But it says Isaiah 43, 19, and I believe this is true for you, for me, and for even this whole body as a whole, this church. 43, 19, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts. Listen, when we get into these ruts, it can feel like we're in the deserts. It can feel dry. It can feel desolate. It can feel disconnected. But it doesn't have to stay that way. It's okay to recognize the season you're in. But at some point, you've got to intentionally get yourself out of it. And he, the Lord was making a way to do just that. Don't go into the remainder of this year with the same summer lull, the same, the same disconnection, the same just acknowledging, yeah, I'm in a rut, but not do anything about it. It's time to take action and to move out into this next season. Will you stand to your feet?